Good evening, everyone. I believe that we are now live on Facebook. Hello, hello, and how are you? Um, we are um, broadcasting live on the Western Supermare Town Council Facebook page as part of our climate change kind of awareness films, really. Uh, things that you can do in your own home if you're worried about the environment, um, who isn't, uh, but things that you can do in your own home to make um, small changes that will have a really big impact. Now, the expert that we have for you this evening is Becky Barnes, really wonderful person. I've known for, for, for hello Becky, I've known for, it's gonna get confusing. I'm Becky Walsh, uh, this is Becky Barnes. So um, we've got a lot of Beckys for you uh, this evening. Um, so we're gonna be talking about um, your wardrobe. Don't worry, we're not coming round there and I'm not gonna come round there with the big black sack and decide, oh, that's the wrong color on you, darling, and just shove it into a bag. Um, but uh, we're gonna be talking about the impact that the fashion industry actually uh, has on the environment. And Becky's a bit of an expert in that. She, I guess, a specialist really in the fashion industry and how that's affecting the environment. So I'm going to hand over to Becky and she can tell you more about all of that. Thank you, Becky, the other Becky. <laughs> Sometimes I feel, you know, a bit of a fraud talking about these things because I sort of classify myself as a really unlikely person to be talking about environmental issues because not so many years ago, it just was completely off my radar. You know, I was just a woman who loved clothes, loved shopping, loved colours. Um, and I just wasn't aware of the impact. And then when I set up my own business, which is helping other women fall in love with their clothes and feel more confident about who they are, I did a lot of networking to try and tell people who I was and what I did and how I could help them. And on the networking scene, I came across an eco designer and she really pricked my conscience because suddenly she made me aware that the fashion industry was completely and utterly polluting, um, polluting for our planet. And it was like something that I didn't want to hear, but I couldn't unhear. So then my journey began with it. I started to research it. Um, and then four years down the line, we're here, which is where I have a business which is now centered around treading as lightly as we can on the planet, but still expressing ourselves through our clothes, still having our own unique style DNA, um, and having a lot of fun with it. So, um, I thought it just might be interesting to start with the connection between climate change and your wardrobe, because it's not necessarily a link that springs to mind immediately. And it may surprise you to know that and when I talk about the fashion industry, actually, I mean the garment industry in its totality. So if you wear clothes, you are part of it. I don't just mean fashionistas and those who are following trends and who buy things all the time. I'm talking about everybody who buys and wears clothes. But that garment industry creates five times as much carbon emissions as the entire airline industry put together. So we're talking about a huge problem here. There's also issues around um, pollution, the way in which our materials are grown. It can be quite water intensive. Also, there are insecticides, pesticides, etc., that are put on it, which then run off into the water. There's then the processing that happens of the fibres, which is adding dyes and colourants, etc., into the water again. There's the way in which garment workers are treated um, and then it ends up on the shop floor um, and then can potentially end up in landfill. So all along the way there's points at which the garment industry is dangerous to our world. Um, and what's really interesting is we, we are now brilliant consumers we are consuming 150 billion garments every year. That's 38 million of those is sold in the UK. I think every week, yeah, every week in the UK, we buy 38 million pieces of clothing. And our consumption of that has just grown hugely. So we're buying 60% more now than we were just 10 years ago. But what's happened is we're buying more, we're paying less for it and we're utilising it less. Our utilisation of our clothes is about 40% down on what it used to be. 
So we're buying more, using it less, throwing it away after a shorter period of time. Um, did you know any of that, Becky? <laughs> no, no. I think, to be honest, what you're talking about there, those stats are actually really alarming, the amount of consumption. Also, I think the stat that you just used about the um, air travel, you know, because we constantly are, you know, stop the airport in Bristol, air travel, air travel, air travel, air travel. So really, I think that that I have found really quite shocking and remarkable in, in terms of the stats that you're talking about there. Um, and like you say, it's not the fashionistas, because I always assume it's the people who are buying your kind of, you know, slave trade style, you know, items for a pound or five pounds or whatever, and not really thinking about where they come from. And then they fall apart, and you use them as a dishcloth. Well, no, my mother would have used them as a dishcloth. <laughs> but, the, but for other people, the minute you get a hole in something, they chuck it out. Um, so I think what's really interesting about what you're saying is, is it's about the, the, the long term kind of like, look at how we're buying things. It's not just the people who are, that's, that's last season. But it's actually people like me who are still wearing clothes that I bought 10, 15 years ago. Um, <laughs> Yeah, actually with a belt. I'd normally say the ones that I can still fit into, but I'm losing weight at the moment. So uh, so at least I can say, to, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and I've done it up another notch on the belt, which makes me feel a little bit better. But yeah, so yeah, I think I think anybody watching this is probably just going to have, uh, yeah, had to pull in. Had to Hopefully, pull in. I mean, you know, it's, it's just, like I said, it's like once you've heard it, you can't really ignore it, I think. And it's just, you decide how you want to take it forward. But you will probably know from your own wardrobe how it's increased over the years. You know, in the 60s and 70s, people probably had around 25 items maximum in their wardrobe. You know, if you project your own wardrobe onto that now, it's probably a very different scenario, you know most people's wardrobes are absolutely groaning with clothes yet they open the door and stare at it and think i've got nothing to wear oh nothing that goes with anything that's another issue yeah but that's <laughs> another issue because when, when you just buy an item by itself you're buying it in isolation and you're not thinking about what else you can go with. Whereas actually, when you are more aware of what's in your wardrobe, you know the colours that are in there, you know the styles that you like, you will only bring in things which are then complementing it, which means you won't have a problem creating an outfit because you're buying things in a similar vein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see people who just seem to be able to do this seamlessly. Like they come out of the house and you're like, how on earth? I mean, I, you know, I've always been someone who's dressed for comfort. Um, but yeah, you see people who seem to be able to do that. But I think that you're right. Um, there's that, um, it's it's a test that they did on jam. I don't know if you've heard about this, but it's a, a shopping mall. And um, they had a shopping mall full of jam, you know, so cherry jam, strawberry jam, damsel jam, jam jam, just lots of jam. And their jam sales went down. When they went back to having three jars of jam, you know, your traditional perhaps raspberry, strawberry, you know, and maybe a black currant, the jam sales went up. And maybe that's also happening with why it takes, you know, a while to get ready, or you're looking at your wardrobe because there's just that sense of overwhelm that there's too much in the wardrobe that you actually can't decide what it is that you want to wear. And you realize, oh, I need to go out and buy some more things. And actually what you really need to do is have less things. So that's a good takeaway that I'm gonna take from what you're saying, Becky, today, and uh, get the black bag out. Yeah, I listened to a talk and um, I forget the name of the speaker, but she said, we're at peak stuff right now. You know, we can't really take much more stuff in our homes and in our wardrobes everywhere. You know, we've just been consuming an awful lot across all levels and we're now pretty much at saturation point where we cannot cope with it anymore. So, you know, I'm, I'm with you that in some cases, less is indeed more. And if you can really sort of thin out your wardrobe, you will end up wearing more of it because typically we're only wearing about 20% of it anyway. And it's because of that overwhelm issue that you talked about. You know, when you open the doors, when you're confronted with 150 items, where do you start? So you just go back to those same outfits which are tried and tested and that you know that work and that fit you. And we just wear those on high rotation. Yeah. So one of the things you can do is wear more of your wardrobe. 
<laughs> yeah, that sounds good. I definitely don't have 150 items. It suddenly makes me think of Carrie in Sex in the City, you know, like <laughs> having a whole room of just kind of wardrobe. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe people do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so uh, who was it? Well, Solo de Castro. So she's one of the founders of Fashion Revolution. Her famous quote is, the most sustainable item of clothing that you own is already in your wardrobe because all the resources, most of the virgin resources have gone into making it, the energy's been put into it, the dyes and chemicals have been put into it, the manpower's gone into it, it's traveled from China to wherever in the world, it's ended up on a shop floor. You know, all of this has happened. So if it's already in your wardrobe, the best thing you can do is value it, honor it, wear it, look after it, repair it. Yeah, yeah. Do you find that people are starting to repair things more now? Do you think, because, I mean, it was always something that my, my mum has always had, a sewing kit and a jar of buttons. Um, you know, so if something was completely worn out, it would go to a dishcloth. If it went from dishcloth, you know, so the buttons would be taken off it and the buttons would go into the button jar. Is, this, is there a resurgence of this happening at the moment or not so much? I think so. I think it's slow progress, but I think there is definitely a make do and mend movement, which is emerging. And it's because this slow fashion movement, which is basically the opposite of fast fashion, is taking hold and it's bringing people with it. And therefore people are becoming curious about how they can mend. And it's, you know, it's a skill that's died out really, you know. Um, I've recently had to take one of my own jumpers to the local shop to have the lady fix it for me because it's knitted and I, I can't knit and I was just so worried about making a complete botch up of it if I tried messing around with it. So I just passed it to the lady and she said, we like your granny in here, you know, because had my granny still been alive, she would have been able to do that for me. But it's just not something that's passed down to the generations. And I think we're having to make a concerted effort to upskill in those areas now so that we can look after our clothes for longer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's funny. I, I realized the other day that maybe I should have had children um, as I used to always have to thread my mother's needles. And then the other day I'm get, like going, oh God, I've turned into my mother. <laughs> I think I you may need more reasons right. than that to start having children. Becky. Yeah, well, I mean, the environmental impact is one of the reasons why I never did, but there you go. <laughs> Oh, but yeah, okay. so, yeah. So with with kind of the a, a little bit more about the environmental impact with yeah. washing clothes, what what are we looking at there with kind of you know detergents? I mean, are, are the things that we buy like the eco type detergents and things like that? Are they kindly asking the smell to leave, or are they actually doing something to get rid of you know in my sports kit, my running kit? Is it actually going to get rid of that? Is it good to use that kind of thing? Or is it just another sales pitch and actually a detergent's just as bad as any other detergent? And what about fibres while we're at it? Detergents um, are a funny thing. I mean, it's always worth looking into the impact on the environment with them. And a lot of people now are actually making their own um, liquids and detergents to put into the washing machines and they're just adding essential oils into it as well. So it's, a, it's somewhere to start. For me, the bigger issue is indeed the microplastics that you talked about, which are teeny tiny bits of plastic that are shed from man-made fibres, namely polyester, acrylic, sort of fleecy type fabrics when you wash them. And they're so small that they just infiltrate all our wall plants. And so they, you know, we, we could be drinking them. Um, they certainly end up in our oceans. And in a recent study, actually one in four fish that ends up on our plate is containing microplastics. So one of the things that you can do if you have those materials in your wardrobe is just to think about how you're washing them. So you can buy things such as a guppy friend, which is a bag which captures those microfibers within it, or you can buy a corable, which does the same thing. But essentially they're captured and you have to put them in the bin so they end up in landfill anyway, <laughs> which is maybe just the lesser evil than going straight into the, the water courses in the ocean. But you can also wash on a lower temperature and you can wash with a fuller load because then that's less agitation for the clothes that are inside the machine. You know, if there's a smaller load, it can move around more, bash into each other when the microfibers are released. 
Oh, that's really interesting. So basically make sure that you've got a full load. And when we're looking at this, so we're kind of like thinking about like fleeces, like what, what, because I mean, you might not realize that, you know, I mean, you obviously recognize what cotton is, but how can you recognize that something is a plastic fiber? If you look at the label and look at what it's made from, <laughs> if it has poly in the word, that means plastic. So be it a polyester, a poly cotton, whatever, that's a big giveaway. Yeah. Um, but also just do a bit of research around your fibres, you know, which are plastic based. And polyester is, is a huge issue, actually, because it now makes up over 60 percent of the clothes that are made. Wow. And polyester, <laughs> polyester comes from a fossil fuel. It comes from, from petrol. And then we use another fossil fuel, largely coal, to process it and spin it out into fibres, which then become made into polyester. And most of the world's polyester is created in China, where three quarters of the energy consumption comes from coal. So we're using a fossil fuel to process another fossil fuel to create something which is non-biodegradable, non-breathable, so it's pretty sweaty to wear. It sheds microplastics, microfibers, and um, what's the other thing? What did I say? Remind uh, me. Becky. So, um, so <laughs> following the whole thing. Um, so, a little break. So, so the. Did I say non-biodegradable? Yes, you did. So non-biodegradable, the amount of fossil fuels that it actually takes to create it in the first place, which is a lot. Um, Microfibers. And let me consult my notes. You know, I'm at that stage in my life where my memory is not what it used to be. I know exactly what you mean. I forget nouns. So I'll be like, can you pass me the, can you pass me the, the thing, you know, the thing that you, the thing that you eat dessert with. I end up being able to describe an inanimate object because I can't remember what it's called and don't even get me started on people's names. Disaster. Awful. Every time. <laughs> right. Got them. Non-biodegradable, leaching microplastics, non-breathable and energy intensive. That's the problem with, yeah. with kind of, with polyester. So another thing you could do is just look to eliminate bringing any more polyester into your wardrobe. Now, that's easier said than done as well, particularly if you have children who are at school because school uniforms and sports kits are littered with the stuff. Yeah. You know, I happen to like vintage clothing as well from the 70s, which also it has just got polyester written all over it. You know, so again, I'm just mindful about what I'm bringing in and then what I'm doing with it once it's in my care, you know. Yeah. Can I minimise picking something up from the 70s you know that that is actually genuinely from the 70s it it almost feels a little bit less guilt ridden because you've because it's something that's been long term loved really in a way and if it doesn't break down then you could love it for a few more years as long as you can find your darning lady so you can just stitch it back up again when it starts to rip yeah, yeah but that, i mean that's a classic example of you know because it's non biodegradable every piece of clothing that has ever been made from polyester is still somewhere on this planet. Unless it's been incinerated, you know, it will be somewhere, you know, it'll be in landfill and it will, it just won't break down. You know, you can put a faux fur coat in landfill and it's still going to be there in 200 years time. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's frightening when you think about the volume. So if you think about, we're going back to 150 billion garments a year that are made, 60% of those are polyester, knocking around the planet, you know, doing quite a lot of damage while it's there. We have to do something about it. <laughs> you know? Which makes complete sense. And of course, it, a lot of this is down to the consumer. So what's your options? What can we do about a lot of this stuff? I mean, is there any more of the doom and gloom that we need to look at before we start looking at options? I'm very happy if there is. Well, sort of. <laughs> Let's just crack on with something positive because this is the thing as well. When you get into environmental issues, I can just go down rabbit holes and get myself really stuck and really overwhelmed with the scale and size of the problem, thinking what on earth can I do as an individual when we've got things happening all around the world which are completely out of my control but actually 
we do have a voice, we do have power, we are consumers, we can be more conscious, we can vote with our pounds, we can make statements with the way in which we are dealing with our clothes. So, you know, I'm a big lover of secondhand clothes. Back in 2017, at the end of 2017, I was challenged with my cousin we thought we could we go all through out 2018 without buying anything from you mm. just to see if we could and because there's such an abundance of great charity shops and vintage shops and pre-loved designer boutiques all accessible it just seemed that it would be a relatively easy year and in fact it was it was a brilliant year it completely changed the way I shop I haven't really gone back ever since to buy new I can probably count on one hand the items that I bought new since then and they have been from ethical brands because I can't bring myself to to do anything else so shopping secondhand is a great thing and there are price points for everybody as well you know if you like Gucci you can get secondhand Gucci and if you like you know high street shops you can get high street shops as well um, and my tip, you know, for charity shopping is whatever you're looking for, think about the demographics of that area. Go to the area in which you think you can find that piece because, you know, whoever's donating is within that area and they are giving to that shop. So as a very stereotypical example, you know, if you wanted a tweed hacking jacket, go to somewhere in the Cotswolds. You know, if you want something which is a bit more kind of studenty, um, alternative, go to the Gloucester Road. You know, if you want to design a dress, go to Clifton Village. Yeah. So think about what it is you're looking for and then match the location to that. There was a great place in Chelsea I used to go to when I was living in London that was just kind of like, it was, I don't know how they afforded the rent, but it was, you know, it was kind of off the King's Road and my God, you know, it was just incredible because it had interesting quirky clothes in it not the kind of normal stuff that you kind of you know go oh yeah there's a nylon brown thing my grandmother would have worn and um, but really interesting clothes and I still have a jacket now that if I put it on and wear it people go oh my god where did you get that from but they used to cut out the label so you couldn't see that it was designer and um, um, so you know you sometimes try and look up where it might have come from um, but yeah so people cut, someone stopped me in the street once and went I know the designer who designed your jacket. I was like, oh, great. And she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, like, a, like a 500 quid jacket. I was like, I like it even more now. I think it cost me a fiver. You know, so things like that are just treasure trove of excitement. You know, it's like being in a jumble sale where, uh, you know, you're young, but you'll still elbow somebody just to get the jumper you want. <laughs> Crazy jumble sales, which we can't do now because of COVID. And you should never elbow somebody at a jumble sale. Just um, note to self. Do you know what? I think I, jumble sales are one of my first memories of clothes and being excited by it. Because, you know, I think it's twice a year the scouts used to go around the village and collect unwanted clothes from everybody. And then the mums would put the tables out in the village hall in a square and pile all these clothes. And I can just remember when I was at primary school, just slowly and methodically moving my way around that square and pulling out fabrics and textures and patterns and colors and prints that caught my eye you can see how you've ended up doing what you do bring back jumble sales. yeah we should bring back jumble sales now because of covid when people are buying things in secondhand shops do you know what they're doing in order to protect um customers from covid yeah so um first of all people come into the shop at any one time you are encouraged to use hand sanitizer upon entry you are encouraged to wear a mask upon entry and you are not able to try anything on so they're all offering a full refund um situation with you uh, you know because you can't try it there and then if you are donating clothes you have goes into quarantine for 72 hours most of them steaming those before they come out anyway um, so by the time they hit the shop floor they have been fully quarantined fully steamed and they should be completely safe for you to handle 
great that's really good to know because not everybody not everybody would know that um so people might be a little bit worried and i'm sure you know you, hopefully people during lockdown were having a good clear out and maybe we've got some nice little gems you never know um yeah. well it's it's worth checking before you go to do a drop-off because around around 70 percent of charity shops are open now not all of them but they are slowly reopening but because they are having to hold everything for so long their storage capacity is limited so quite quickly um shops are getting to their maximum load for donations in any one day so always check with the shop beforehand that firstly they're accepting and then go early because normally by 11 they are they're full wow that's a really really good point and something i hadn't considered so that makes complete sense what else can we do becky what other good things have you got on your list you can swap ah. swapping your clothes is a great thing i set up um little green wardrobe last year and it is a regular clothes swap within the bristol area we've had to put it on hold but in the few swaps that we have, it's all to raise money for labour behind the label. Um, we swapped hundreds, literally hundreds of items of clothes, exchanged hands and went to new owners. So something that was unloved by somebody became loved by somebody else. So you can go to organised clothes swaps or also just get a group of your friends together, particularly if you like their clothes, invite them over tell them to bring their cast off and then just have a really fun afternoon or evening just exchanging things sounds it's good so and sometimes you know you don't realize that something actually suits you until you put it on so i've got a friend of mine who's really great with things like this so she'll go oh this will look great on you and i'm like you are joking that's going to be awful and then she makes me put it on i go oh yeah actually that looks really good because we we get used to what we feel comfortable in so actually a clothes swap with your friends you know for example you're wearing a really beautiful jumpsuit I'd never consider wearing a jumpsuit, but if I tried on a jumpsuit that belonged to you that fit me, I might therefore then go, oh, actually, jumpsuits aren't all about how quickly you can go to the toilet. And um, so <laughs> it's like convenience. <laughs> That's I the one downside. <laughs> that is the downside. Yeah, yeah. The BBC Radio Br Bristol presenter Laura Rawlins discovered that when you've got like four minutes to go and use the bathroom when you're listening to a song, she posted that oh. on Twitter. I thought, yeah, that's tricky. You suddenly go, Hmm, that's going to take me two minutes to get in, two minutes to get out, <laughs> and then I'm back on air. So yeah, also they're... not great at festivals either when you're in portaloos, you know, and you have to pull everything down and it drags on the floor. That's Ooh. also not a good situation. Not a good situation. But at least, therefore, apart from my practical head, at least I would be able to go and try something that I didn't know fit me and look great. And so that those are really good, um, good solutions as well. And also, um, I think with, with COVID, if we have got these shops that are getting too full, then yeah, actually having kind of like a clothes swap with other people, if it's done safely, would be, would be a great idea. That's great. Yeah. You can also rent. So renting is something which is becoming more and more prevalent. Um, and it started off with mainly sort of dressy uh, outfits. So if you had an occasion to go to, it would make no sense really to spend a lot of money buying something which you're likely only to wear once. And so companies such as um, Girl Meets Dress, Front Row, Her Collective offer um, rentals. And, you know, it's sometimes an opportunity for you to get maybe a designer piece and wear it for three days, you know, which you might not have ordinarily been able to afford. But also there's the more sort of practical and everyday side of things. So within Bristol, we have Bells and Babe, which is a brilliant company, and they hire out baby bundles. Now, children and babies just grow so quickly that, again, if you think, you only need anything for say like a three or six month period of time and then it's redundant so you can hire a baby bundle for your baby at that particular age when they've grown and they're in the next age you send it back and you get the next set through I've never also, heard of that that's genius it's fantastic um particularly this company because and sustainably sourced brands so not only is she hiring out and reusing and, and providing a great service but the companies that she deals with are also amazing 
Um, you can also hire maternity capsule wardrobes and nursing wardrobes as well. So again, things which you might not want to invest money in or know that you know, you're only going to use for a short amount of time, you can think about hiring instead of buying. Yeah, that's a really great idea. And I didn't even know that those kinds of companies existed. I think that that's fantastic. What a good tip. Other tips, Becky, I'm just going to keep putting you on the spot. What else? What else? <laughs> what else have I got on my list? So you can join a movement. If you think, right, by myself, I'm not going to have an impact. Join somebody who's out there already making waves and who's already got power and influence behind them. So one of those is you can join Fashion Revolution. Now, Fashion Revolution sprung up after the Rana Plaza disaster and they are really there for people to put pressure on their favourite brands to ask the question around who made my clothes. So they run a number of campaigns throughout the year. You can support them, you can get behind them, you can you can participate in their movement and really have your voice heard. Also, I've just mentioned them before, Labour Behind the Label is a Bristol-based charity who are looking to improve the rights of garment workers around the world. They're fantastic. I've supported them for years. And again, um, in the news, we've just recently heard about the slave labour that's been going on in Leicester. So Labour Behind the Label are, have been campaigning against this for so long, but now it's sort of broken out into mainstream news and so many more people are aware of it. So again, you can support their work because they are making waves, they are gaining traction and they are putting pressure on big brands to increase their transparency around how clothes are made and they've just launched today actually something called fashionchecker.org where you can go on and put in maybe your favorite brand and just see how they measure up wow and where can you find that uh fashionchecker.org online okay. great i will go to yeah if you go to labor behind the label as a similar thing, actually, there's an app you can download called Good On You, which actually originated in Australia, but is being populated with more and more of our own brands. And again, you can pop in your retailer and just see how they score against a number of measures. Um, it, it will look at um, the materials it's using, the impact on the environment. It will look at um, labor and just give you an overall rating. So again, there's another couple of tools that you can use if you really want to start investigating some of the brands that you might know and love. So get behind a movement, label behind label. You can also join a wider movement, something like um, the work Polly Higgins was doing before she died. And that is, um, she created the concept of ecocide, which means that if you as a business are damaging the environment through whatever you're making or processing you can actually go to jail for it right. they're trying to create a law and so you can become what's called an earth protector um, and again be part of that movement and there are lots of other things you can do and organizations you can join as well but i always feel you know that by supporting these people as well you are really really helping to bring about change yeah, absolutely. It's what you were saying before about um, how, you know, we pay with our money and, you know, money does talk. So we've had some questions come in, Becky, on, on Facebook, if that's all right, if I can run those by you. Um, Debbie has said, uh, do you think that there will be a surge in online charity shops to compete with the likes of um, high street s um, stores um, such as um, RE Fashion and Oxfam Online? So the question there, if I've read it correctly, is about the, um, that we can have shops on the high street that are competing with some of the uh, online purchase options that are also secondhand. I think there will be um, an so the demand is there and we were just having a quick chat before we went live and it's my feeling that a lot of donations that are going going into the charity shops um some of the sort of higher end pieces are being hived off for their online sales and um it, why not it's it's a great thing for us to have access to national charity platforms rather than what might just be on our doorstep 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense. We're having a couple of um, internet uh, buffering problems. I'm just going to do something one second. So um, everyone hang tight. If we lose you, we will come back. But I just want to see if there's a way in which I can clear the line a little bit. So um, stay where you are, everyone. Okay, so hopefully I haven't lost you. You still there, Becky? Good. I'm still here. Excellent. That's good. I just wanted to just um, try and fix that little issue that we have. So hopefully I've managed to fix it. Um, so Becky, um, we have a definite uh, thing about Becky's today. Uh, we've got an another Becky uh, as well. <laughs> which is great. Another Becky. Three Beckys now. Um, so Becky asks, um, although I'm mostly a second-hand buyer, my daughter, who's 14, um, um, will not really want to get second-hand clothes. I remember being called Oxy at school because I had second-hand clothes. Where did you get that from Oxfam? It's like, ugh. and I had, actually. Um, but uh, uh, she said, you know, she, she'll always prefer Primark. So, um, you know, she just hasn't been educated in that way. And in fact, it was very much like that when, when I was at school, I had like second-hand school uniforms, second-hand clothes, and um, there was a certain amount of bullying that goes on with that that kids are obviously trying to to really um, avoid how can we educate teenagers into feeling that it's completely acceptable to be wearing secondhand clothes do you have any thoughts on that becky it, <laughs> it's a toughie right because i understand that secondhand is not for everybody i've worked with enough women now to know that there are quite a number of reasons actually why secondhand doesn't sit well with some people and I probably won't be able to ever change that so you know um, other than if you want to have a go at changing opinions and saying that actually secondhand is okay I would look online for some really great role models so actually if um, Becky's daughter like somebody in particular you know we might find somebody in her age group who is a slow fashion role model and you can follow them on social media and actually hopefully become influenced by them as to how they're sourcing their clothes you can also sit down with your children and show them a couple of documentaries so there's one i think it's it's i think it's called river blue and it's very impactful and it just talks about the impact of the industry on the earth's water supply you know that's a great watch or you can sit down and download you know stacy dooley's fashion dirty secrets i think it's called um but again if your own words are failing to have an impact on your children or your peer group or the rest of your family then just present them with some of these resources and just see if that strikes a chord. If you're still not up for second hand, and there will always be people who aren't up for second hand, what you can do is just buy less, so lower your consumption in the first place, but also buy better. So buy things which are the best quality that you can afford. You know, when you're trying things on, look at the hems, look at the stitching, look at the way the buttons have been put on and ask yourself, is this going to last me years or are things going to start popping off after the first wash? You know, and also there was a really interesting interview that I listened to with one of Fashion Revolution's leaders who was talking about if you really, really love Primark or you love Zara or, you, you know, or any other fast fashion brand what can you do so firstly if you join one of the movements like fashion revolution and put pressure on the band and ask them who made their clothes you might get heard but secondly she said treat those clothes as if you'd paid hundreds of pounds for them if you spent two quid on a t-shirt the value you assign to it is probably quite low and therefore it's easy for you to let go of it and discard it and move on to the next thing quite quickly. But if you pay two pounds, but act as if it costs 200 pounds, then that changes the dynamic of your relationship with the clothing and hopefully makes you look after it and hold on to it for much longer. 
Yeah, that's really good advice because a lot of this is the psychological impact, isn't it? Which is where branding comes from. You know, so I've got a brand, I'm wearing a brand, I've got this label on, it says something about me. And of course, you know, as we're moving into the future, what it's going to start to say about you is that you don't care about the environment. <laughs> I mean, not necessarily yeah. brand clothes, because brand clothes can be really, really well made and, you know, because we've spent more money on them. So it isn't always about the label, but it's quite interesting how, you know, maybe if you're buying secondhand clothes, what it will say about you is the fact that you, you know, that you are a caring person. So, um, yeah, maybe the branding is going to have a different way of looking at it. So that makes sense. I, I totally agree. I fully buy into the concept of you are what you wear in the same way that you are what you eat. You are what you wear. So. I wear my values and I think it's something which is going to become more prevalent as well because people are interested in this, people want to support it and therefore will find a way through. But you have to find a way through which brings you joy. Yeah. And this is the other thing that I'm really passionate about is that I don't want anyone to feel guilt tripped into this. I don't want anyone to feel that they have to. I want people to join this movement and find something for them which is bringing them joy and that they feel that they are getting something from it. And all too often the sort of green police can come out when you try and do something positive. And I, I really hope that they're coming at it and their purity and their sort of militancy around it is driven because they care so much. But actually, I don't find it really useful. I would much rather there be a hundred people out there giving something a go, just something, even if it's imperfect, rather than just one person doing something absolutely perfectly, you know? So I think, you know, we can all do something and we should all not feel guilty about not doing more. That's a really good place to leave it. But is there any kind of final thoughts, any takeaway points that you want people to know before we say goodnight from the two Beckys? Like the two <laughs> <laughs> Last point, please never, ever, ever, ever put your clothes in the bin. We have a, a big rubbish bin of clothes going into landfill every single second. Um, and we need to stop that. So always recycle your textiles and put it in the recycling bin rather than the um, landfill bin. So even if it's got massive holes in it and your spaghetti soup stain is still down the front, even though you've washed it a thousand times, put it in the recycle bin rather than putting it in the bin bin. Yeah, because even if it ends up being downcycled, you know, i.e. chopped up and used for insulation or rags or whatever, it's still extending the life cycle of that garment. Yeah, it's going to be used for something positive instead of it just going, you know, just cluttering up the earth again. Brilliant, Becky. I'm just going to quickly check and make sure that we haven't had anyone ask any more questions before I say goodbye. No, nope, that's great. And thank you ever so much for everyone who's been watching and participating in um, asking questions. Lorna also said that um, she only buys secondhand clothes. And in actual fact, she's just been to a jumble sale recently, just before COVID. So jumble sales... Oh, I'm so jealous, Lorna. <laughs> yeah, Tell me where the next one is. <laughs> Yeah, you can post, isn't it? <laughs> I think the next jumble sale is going to be in my living room. I've got I've got some very, <laughs> very well dressed friends. So let's see what happens. Um, great. Thank you ever so much, Becky. Absolutely stunning as ever. I knew that you'd be brilliant. Um, and thank you every everybody for watching. Um, we are going to be doing this on a monthly basis, bringing in experts on everything to do with the environment um, in a positive way to be able to give you tips and things that maybe you hadn't thought of. I know today, Becky, I've learned loads of things that I hadn't considered, hadn't thought of, and didn't even know about, and a lot of the links that you've, you've shared as well. In fact, I might ask you um, to type up some of those and put them into the, into the chat if you get the chance. Um, but yeah, so thank you ever so much. So we'll keep doing that. If you've got any nominations of people that you would like us to um, have on as guests or subjects that you would like us to cover, um, then do put uh, a little note or you can private message on the Town Council Facebook page. And um, thank you again. Uh, for joining us and thank you again for Becky Barnes. All right, have a lovely evening everyone. Bye.